Well, welcome everyone to the uh, Playmaker Football Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Kepke, and we're joined today by uh, Besaid Oroch's owner, Kyle Kish, and uh, and Syracuse owner, Michael Doherty. How's it going, guys? Good, good, man. How about you? Oh, just another great day in paradise. How about you, Kyle? Yeah, doing great, man. Love the life. So, gentlemen, uh, let's start with you guys know each other from outside of Playmaker. Is that correct? Yep, that's Unfortunately. correct. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, Kyle, you got into the league because of Mike. Um, how did he convince you to join the league? <laughs> yeah, Mike and I used to work together uh, in optical, and he must have harassed me probably, what, 50 times about yeah. joining? Back Longer in, than that, because I, I would prep at work. I had my laptop would. at work, and <laughs> I would be showing Kyle different things that I'm doing, and, and, oh, I won this week, or, you know, I lost this week, or whatever. So I would just keep showing him everything that I was doing, especially because I was prepping at work. So it was kind of easy to, um, you know, show him stuff. It so. was like season four or season five. And, and I know by the end of the seasons, I'd be like, Oh, how was your matchup against this person? Like, mm-hmm. so like I started to know and feel the the teams out and stuff like that. I want to say season five is, is but, when we started really talking about it. I could be wrong, but. You're probably right. Cause I joined season seven. So it took me a little bit. Yeah. Season yeah. six is six is the one I made it to the bowl, and that's when you really got into it. Yeah. And yep. yep. So Kyle was one of our first unofficial fans of the league. Then he he knew all the teams before he <laughs> before he got to join. Yeah, pretty Probably, much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Mike, how about you? I I don't. I, obviously, you were in the league before I got there. Um, how did you end up joining? Yeah, so um, I joined because of Bryce, um, who was at the time New Berlin um, Knights, I think is who he was. Um, he talked about it all the time, and and I was always very interested, but um, there wasn't really a spot available, I guess, at that time. And, you know, I didn't really know George. I did, you know, I, I barely knew Eric at that point, um, Sheer, and, you know, eventually a spot opened up, and, and whose team did I end up taking over? Scranton, Scranton City Stranglers, I think, was the team that I took over, which was one of Bryce's friends. Yeah. And um, Love the eventually spot opened up, and I'm like, hell yeah, I want to do it. Um, but it's, it's that first year, and maybe you both can attest to this, that first year is always tricky because off season or preseason or whatever, you have no idea what you're doing. And it's uh, maybe a little hard to get motivation um, until you get like that first week, and then it's like, oh, I like this. Yeah. Kyle, you had. Um you've obviously had help um, because Mike was able to show you and and you got some time to be able to experience it before you jumped in with two feet, but you definitely had some great success early on as a, as a new coach. You're not necessarily new anymore, but you had some good success in your first couple seasons. Um, Why do you think that was? Yeah, I think uh, the first season I went five and five, uh, which was pretty dope. Um, But I started the season zero and five. All right. And it definitely goes to what Mike is saying is it's it's tough as a new coach uh, to get your um, your feet set and really understand the game. So I grinded every single day. I mean, like every single second of every single day, I was um, <clears throat> making sure that my players weren't running out of bounds, side sideline to sideline, end zone, um, just creating as many plays as I could. And uh, to any new coaches or coaches that join, really listen to the veteran coaches. You know, you may think that you know a lot, but you don't know anything. You know, when you join this, you have to assume that you know nothing and everybody else knows more than you. So I just kind of took everybody's advice and, you know, somebody would say one thing and I would just run with it and I would adapt. Mm -hmm. Um, What really helped me win those last five games, though, uh, is I actually started to mimic other coaches' plays. Um, that helped a lot. Uh, so I would actually video record on my phone uh, people's plays, and then I can um, time scale it and watch every single movement of the players, and then I can kind of mimic some of the plays that they developed. So that, that really helped a lot. Yeah, that's neat. That's neat. I, I always ended up just you doing YouTube and then slowing it down to like 0.25 or, or whatever for, for the same thing. Um, 
But I found that even, I mean, you might experience this too. I found that even when I try and mimic plays, sometimes it doesn't work. For example, I actually tried to mimic, uh, Kyle, a lot of your uh, fullback uh, runs, but I think the difference is having a 100-speed fullback versus a 75-speed fullback really <laughs> changes that flavor. Um, it helps a lot. <laughs> so what, what's it like having a 100-speed uh, well, fullback? Do you find that you can just run the same plays what with your fullback versus running back, or do you find it's a different experience? No, absolutely. I mean, ideally, you can you can run exactly the same plays if your running back's at 75 speed, your fullback's at 75 speed. So um, that's the first thing I did is I mimicked every single running back play with my fullback, um, and I was able to just mass produce as many uh, fullback runs as I could. So, and what helps with that? I mean, obviously. Uh, 75 speed or 100 speed fullback is not a 100 speed running back, but it helps with injuries. Um, you know, if you look at like last season, yeah. right? Like, yeah, if you look at last season, I was, I think, top 10 uh, for rushing. I might have been like nine or 10. But if you is that look good? at out of 14 teams, it was 16 <laughs> teams, Dick. <laughs> So it was like middle of the pack. I, I think I was second to last of breaking a thousand yards, right? So, you know, just I think I did I actually have it written down here, twelve sixty-three yards, but my running backs go five eleven, four twenty-one, and three oh five. So I was able to, you know, use every single player to avoid injury. And that's ideally what the run the fullback can do for you is um, make sure that the running back doesn't get hurt. So my, my running back got hurt for two weeks, but it was because I was a dumbass and threw to him like 30 times. So, so Mike, you're obviously no stranger to uh, speed players yourself. Um, a few seasons ago, not only did you have um, 200 speed wide receivers, but didn't you also have a hundred speed running back or tight end or something? Am I, am I misremembering? No, I had all of those. I had 200 speed wide receivers. At 100 speed tight end and 100 speed halfback. Yeah, so, good. talk to me, talk to me about the value of of that. Obviously, they're coveted, but what does that do for your playbook, or how does that change your planning or prep? What what do you, what do you think is the like maybe unforeseen benefit of all that? I think it's a detriment, to be honest. I mean, really, not not, and maybe that's <laughs> not the right thing because obviously those players are awesome to have and right. great to make a run with, but I think it makes you lazy on your play design because um, the 100 speed player, you can get away with so much that with a 75 speed player, you just can't get away with. So, you know, it's good to have, and, and they're definitely a great weapon to have. And, you know, you're trying to make a run. Those, those are the guys that you definitely want. Um, but long-term, I think it not even, maybe doesn't make you lazy, but it just makes, um, it just changes how you design plays, I guess. Right. So did you feel like maybe it, it was overwhelming to have that many players at any point in time? Like you couldn't get the ball to both Bill Carter and Steve Boat and uh, I forget your running back's name, but you couldn't. Brad you couldn't Jackson. Get, Brad, Brad Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. Yep. You couldn't get Future the ball. Hall of Famer. <laughs> <laughs> you had to throw that in there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't have too much issue with that. I mean, I always tried to spread the ball around. I tried not to be one dimensional at all. Um, so one of the biggest things I always, you know, made sure I was doing was um, not getting any hurt, you know, five catches here, five catches there and, and, you know, get out of the game with a win and, and no one hurt was always kind of my, my recipe, but also it kind of got a little annoying when like, you kind of want to get the stats. You want to have those um, Pro Bowl players and MVP award winners, but that year I had such a stacked team that it was a lot of the wins at least were blowouts, maybe not all of them. Um, and it, it made things tricky sometimes, I think, with, uh, you know, kind of trying to find the the stats with the, with not being a dick, if you will. <laughs> Mike, well, uh, you you uh, went deep a lot that season when you had all those players, right? Uh, I mean, I did sometimes, yeah. I wouldn't say, you know, a bunch, but... Um, biggest thing I would always do is, is throw to Brad Jackson a lot. I'm a halfback. Um, I think maybe the only player I struggled getting the most touches to that I could have was um, Hogue, who was my 
hundred speed tight end. Um, you know, I, I'd get him involved here and there, um, but I think he was one that I struggled getting involved more. Um, so at, at the at the very least here, we have at least one play from uh, from that hundred speed year. So uh, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. So uh, I believe this is the right one. At least I'm hoping. Um, so this was uh, from season seven. Uh, so it's a little while ago. But I found this fascinating, um, the the power of having 100-speed wide receiver. So uh, on our screen here, we have sort of a trips left thing going on. And Bill Carter, I believe, is the uh, middle player. And uh, the first player is going to clear out the safety. And then Bill is basically going to run a, a corner and then into a nine route. And uh, we can see just how awesome that speed is and and how unprepared, if you're not 50 yards back, um, that can just burn you. So what what do you think um, now, like if, if you were to not have 100 speeds, would you still design the play the same way or would it be um, something different? Would you not even dare to try a nine like that? No, I'd still do it if it worked. Um, you know, and I, I still have probably that same exact play in my playbook with the timing different, uh, but it's just depending on, you know, in prep, if it's showing up, if it's working, um, whether or not I'm going to run it. I think when you have those players, you know, the 100 speed players, that play is going to work more often than than with the 75 speed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still have that and I, I don't have any qualms against running it. It's just whether they hit or not at right. a rate that I want it to hit. So, Kyle, now you're in the same boat that uh, Mike has been in uh, before where you have uh, such a tremendous roster. Um, it's it's stacked all over the board. Uh, we'll actually come back to this in a moment here. <laughs> yeah, bring up the team. <laughs> yeah, but we'll 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 bring up your team here, and uh, it's it's uh, quite impressive. I mean, we have two starting caliber uh, quarterbacks, or at least uh, at, enough to fill in for one starting running back, of course, uh, two cal two starting caliber fullbacks. 200 speed wide receivers. Uh, the list just goes on. You have speed at, on the uh, line and then all sorts of speed in the defense as well, including 300 speed linebackers, a 100 speed cornerback and a 100 speed safety. And not to mention you could easily play um, dime all day with uh, four other defensive backs at 75 speed. So that's one hell of a roster. Um <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you built that from the ground up with lots of awesome trades. Um, what do you think your plan is with all of that? Do you do you do you worry that you're gonna end up getting lazy, like Mike said? Oh, Mike said I was gonna get lazy. No, <laughs> they, they could end up kind of falling back on your um, speed and not game plan. Oh. Uh, not not you specifically, but um, any any of us. When, could, when could. you have the talent, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I remember. You, when you have the talent, you kind of rely on the talent as opposed to your skill. I mean, right. hopefully that's not the case. Um, it took a lot of time to build this team, you know, and a lot of trades. I mean, I've been trade happy. And ask George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but you have to understand, like, I started, uh, I joined with an expansion team. So I was able to draft some youth. And I only had one 100 speed cornerback when I drafted. And then when I went into season seven uh, draft, I was, I was picked 13 that season. Then season eight, I was picked five or six. Or I had both of them. So I don't remember which one I was, five or six. Season nine, I was picked three. And then season 10, I was picked 10. Those are my picks. Mm. So to build this kind of roster with with that would be just my picks is not possible. So I only can do that with the solid trades that I did. Um, so a lot of people, you know, question the moves that I was making, but the moves that I made brought uh, a ton of elite speed and a ton of elite youth. You know, the only um, seasoned player I have that could retire that's 100 speed is Steve Boat. Everybody else is staying at least one more year. Yeah, exactly. It's a very young roster. So I was curious about that. What are your thoughts when you uh, approach trades? Because you seem to have a knack for it. Um, 
And, and I think in previous seasons, maybe it was a bit more um, lopsided is the wrong word, but I, I think you won a lot of the trades. And I look at this season and um, maybe it's not that you won because I can see where you are um, uh, trying to win for the next season or two and, and have yourself a, a small dynasty here. So trading away two uh, very wonderful uh, starting caliber players for, yep. for, a, for a pick here. Um, so what are your thoughts when you're approaching trades, maybe in previous seasons and, and in this season? Yeah, so uh, in the beginning, my goal was to uh, win every trade, uh, honestly. And, and I did a lot of them, uh, to be fair. Um, you know, I did a, a 75 speed rookie running back for a season or a round one and a round three, you know, so, you know, little wins like that. Uh, got me to build my team and then I started to get reckless on purpose. Okay. Uh, I know people think that's crazy, but I mean, I did a trade with Mike where I traded like four 75 speed players or something ridiculous like that for a hundred speed player. And right now for that me, Bo or was that, you're talking about Gatlin? Gatlin. Gat, no. Gatlin. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you hear it right there. Yep. Yeah. Um, insane, insane trade. We should Probably talk about that trade. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's as, in, it's as insane as as you uh, make it out to be. It's definitely um, like Mike gets the the youth and yeah. um, technically maybe a, a more well-rounded player, maybe. Um, plus, he gets a, a second round pick next season. But you have a 100 speed player that's going to be here yeah. uh, for at least another three, you know, two to three seasons. Easy. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think Mike makes out on that trade. Honestly, um, you know, I want to do that trade all day, but the only thing that I need is elite speed. So I'm willing to sacrifice for. Elite and you speed. can say that I, I made out on that trade, but also Kyle, like your team was able to afford that. Like you yeah. didn't have any needs, man. Like those picks that you got or traded me or those players mm -hmm. were like, you have replacements. It, it, it was such an easy trade for you to do because yeah. that's elite speed that you got. And you gave up players that didn't matter, you know, frankly, you know, not that they're bad players because they, I'm not saying that, but you didn't need them. Well, I trade, I think one of them's a 75 speed safety. I'm benching a 75 speed safety half my game anyways, you know, yep, exactly. still, still. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one thing I think the league has um, kind of joked about for the last few years is how long does Kyle, you know, push, push the team forward with all the draft picks and at what point does he push in his chips? And it sounds like um, you're starting to really grasp the game to, uh, and you've got some big wins under your belt now. And now you've got the team to support it. So even if you don't have picks for another season or two, I mean, you've got the team. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and my goal was, so when I joined seven, my goal was within two seasons. So my third season playing to make playoffs, which I did. And then my next season, I want to make a run for it. So that's right now. I'm I'm very jealous because you did what I did, but you just did it better. <laughs> <laughs> my first season, I tried to essentially do the same thing. Everyone, I sold off the, the farm um, with the exception of one or two players, except Bill Carter. And then uh, and then I tried to do the same thing, just get better over time. But you were able to to have more success. So I'm always just this much jealous of you being able to get the team and, and have the talent to do it too. You gave me the idea when we, for, when I first joined, uh, <laughs> you were, you were the one that inspired me, man. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think we've taken a look at this yet, but with that talent, um, you made it to the playoffs uh, last season and in a heartbreaker, um, some might say because of uh, a, a failed attempt at a field goal, um, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you didn't make it in advance to the next round. Um, but I do love this series you had against Kodiak. So um, he scores on you. You get the ball for the first time. And you just throw essentially nine routes on the sideline that are 10 yards deep. And it's just working. And a lot of them are to uh, Jeff Wyatt here. But I think some might even be to your fullback. Um, yeah, that's that's incredible. Do you 
Did you plan this against Kodiak? Did you plan uh, these nine routes like that? Or what was it just a play that was working? Yeah, I mean, every playbook I do, obviously, you know, statistics. I'm going to take the best plays that are working. Um, but I'll also take a look at what I submitted last time I played them. And <clears throat> the last time him and I played, I didn't attack the sidelines as much as I did this time. So I was kind of trying to hope to throw him off uh, off his game, hoping that when he preps that um, he's going to look at the numbers and it's going to spread the defense more inside because I wasn't attacking the outside. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I switched it up and attacked the outside a lot um, for this game. And it did. it worked out pretty well, obviously, as you can tell, just not well enough. <laughs> yeah. And that that comes with time. I think all of us would say the same thing. It's just a few more AI tweaks, and uh, your offense was clearly working that game. Um, yeah. Just needed to get a couple more things straight. But but Kodiak was tough last year. Obviously, making it to the uh, the championship. So um, you lost a close game, and and you did way better than I did against Kodiak. So kudos to you. Thanks. Um, it it it's a big heartbreaker for me because it, you know it was my first playoff game. So. I felt really accomplished making it. It was my goal to make it that season. I didn't expect to make it previous seasons. Uh, so I was super pumped going in. I've got a pretty good record against Kodiak going in. So I was feeling pretty confident. I threw in some stuff that I knew he wasn't going to expect. But I think the uh, the biggest gut wrench for me was I always run a thousand games after to see statistically who would win. And uh, statistically, I beat him by eight. So the games ended up 33 to 26, which would be a, a seven spread. But yeah. you guys know that. What, what was the win percentage? Did you, know, did you have that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I won 71.5% of the games to his 28.4, uh, his <laughs> rounding. It, it can be a thing. I actually asked George to rerun. I believe my week eight or week nine game against uh, Kodiak the second time we faced. And I remember I, I was, I was livid because I had never put in so much work uh, against Meissen, um, knowing that uh, in previous years, maybe Meissen didn't try quite as hard. And recently he had been putting forth the effort and I was, you know, I was darn right confused. <laughs> and I asked George to rerun uh, the games on his computer just to see and uh, very, uh, very similar thing. Like I was winning probably about 75% of the time by probably about 10 to 12 points. It just sometimes you just, you know, playmaker can be fickle or unlucky or, you know, that game that runs is one of those 25% of the time. But that's what makes this fun too, right? Is Absolutely. you never know. You never yep. know. It's a game of statistics, but it's only one game that we play, guys. One yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's why we watch and and you never know. And I'm not going to reopen it because if you uh, watched last week's podcast, you know that we talked to uh, Ruffy about the the infamous uh, fumble against Syracuse. But really, <laughs> really quick, Mike, what was your what was your thought on that game uh, in the moment and afterwards? Well, we'll even get to like previous before the game um, because you know Ruff and I have played a lot over the last few years well for a few seasons whatever you want to call it um my last loss to him was season six i think it was and it was an overtime game and one of those games too i think i, I showed kyle this where you know i was winning you know the majority of those games by 13 points after reruns not that that really matters but you know then i played him in the playoffs that year and that was the year that i think i beat him that i beat george um and lost a you know sheer in the in the bowl but um Ever since then, I mean, I've played him two, uh, three, three times a year since then. So for me, like, I'm happy that I'm always, you know, I beat him for the most part. Um, but I, I just knew that sooner or later that's going to come back because he had a lot of good books on me, you know, and, and a lot of the, the wins that I had against him, I don't think, you know, regular season, he doesn't, he's, I don't think he takes as seriously as, as playoffs, obviously. Um so he had a lot of good books. So I, I mean, I was confident that I would win, but also I knew like sooner or later he's going to catch me. And that kind of felt like the game that he was catching me. And I just, I got lucky, you know, there's, there's no, no doubt about it, but also that's, that's part of the game, you know? Right. 
Yeah. You, you put in um, a tremendous amount of work like a lot of other coaches do, but I think when I watch your games versus other people's, I'm, you and uh, Shear have some of the most creative offensive plays that I see. Like they're, they're different. A lot of us have the same kind of tosses to the outside. A lot of us have the same, um, you know, corner slants or uh, sideline slants. Um, but some of your plays are just different. So case in point, um, one of these plays, and it's possible that you took this from someone else too. Um, but this was one of the first times I remember seeing this. So you, you have two running backs in the backfield and they're both going to run essentially a corner route. And I don't know if you're reading anyone else or if all those receivers are just clearing out the uh, DBs, but it's fun to watch. And you're going to run this play about four or five times on this drive. Um, tell me what's going on here. Yeah. So it might actually, I'm trying to see who that was too. Do you, does it show who it's to? Uh, you know, yeah. Tell. Unfortunately, the video uh, got, gets a little great. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go back here. It, it's not a huge deal. I mean, I have a couple different versions of that play um, with different people in the backfield. I think I have um, my tight end and my halfback back there. And one, I think I have um, fullback and, and halfback and another. Um, I do have it set up as a screen, as a scan and as a timed route, but I don't, I don't remember for sure which one this one was, uh, but it was killing it. Uh, yeah. It was a hog. Yeah. Yep, yeah. The tight end. Yeah. And that's legal. You know, as long as you have, you know, any running back or fullback that's on the field has to be in the backfield with him. Yep. Um, cool. and that's, that's com completely doable. Um, it's not a play I took for anybody from anybody. It's not a play that I, I saw. I just um, probably, honestly, it was from watching like an NFL game or something like that. And I, I saw something similar. Um, I, I like to recreate plays that I see in, in the NFL a lot. Um, and then, you know, I kind of take it from there and, and see what works. So uh, I know a lot of us do the same thing. Like you get really um, creative when you watch the NFL games and you try and you try and place uh, those plays into playmaker. And a lot of times it just doesn't work. You, <laughs> you, you can't recreate, uh, something from the Super Bowl because a halfback pass just doesn't work or <laughs> no, it does not <laughs> watching, watching Kansas city do that little flip to Travis Kelsey in the middle of the line just doesn't work in playmaker. So, um, what are, what are some for both of you guys, what are some things that have been frustrating about playmaking, like literally making plays that you've seen in real life, or what are some successes that you've had? Go ahead, Kyle. Um, <laughs> so real life, I mean, I guess I don't mimic too many real life plays. Obviously, I'll mimic more like video, you know, video game plays. So Madden, you know, um, you got your hooks and your slant routes, you know, your deep ball um, passes, but when you're creating plays in playmaker football you have to realize that you're completely playing against computer um so the players are designed to do the defense is designed to do something you know so if they're in zone coverage or man to man you know you have to learn how to beat a zone if a zone you know i can I can draw a play right now, and I guarantee half you guys have that defensive playbook. You know, a play in a playbook. You know, you you put a cover two, um, maybe a couple linebackers playing a micro zone, right? And then you got your your defensive line rushing the quarterback. You know, it's with your you know with the corners man to man. You know, so you can recreate plays, and the defense is going to be automatically set to do something it's it's different element than you know watching the nfl because you eliminate the human element right so, so you you find it um easier to kind of create offensive plays by thinking about the way that defensive plays are made within playbook the the ai intelligence can only go so far correct 100 percent. yeah, yeah I mean, this game for me is all about statistics and, and analytics and things like that. So if you can beat the computer, that's that's the way I think. So, Mike, I'll come back to you in a second for that. But, Kyle, that brings up an interesting thought. I love asking people 
Would you, when when you're prepping and you're deciding between um, a couple of plays, Kyle, would you rather have um, a play that um, goes, let's say, 65% for uh, 12 yards or a play that goes like like 80% but only for five yards? Like, what, what would you prefer? Yeah, I'll put the 65% in all day. All right. And then I'll put a third and five. I'll put the 80% in 100% of the time with priority high. So I'll be getting the first down when I need to. I'll be driving the ball um, 65% of the time uh, with the other play. So if you run it first and second down, you're going to complete a first down. So you wouldn't choose between the two plays. You might even incorporate both plays in and just have them more situational then. It sounds like. Yeah, 100%. I would just put the the first one 65% of the time, first and second down, and then I'd put the the third and five in with only five yards. You know, you don't want to put it 10 yards if it's only going five yards. So I'd probably incorporate both of them, you know, if that's my only play option. Yeah. So, Mike, how about you? What are your thoughts about uh, (laughs) everything we've just discussed, all the playmaking and and real life, where do you get your inspiration from, things like that? Yeah, um, you know, I agree with Kyle. A lot of, um, you know, the information is statistics and and kind of what you're seeing. Um, But the other thing I think that really helps is just prepping against good people. And two examples, um, season, man, season four, maybe season, yeah, it must have been season four. I played uh, Webster in the first round of playoffs, and that was my first ever playoff game. He beat me. Uh, He beat me pretty, pretty sound. Um, But he had one play, and that was to Walter Fields, I think is what it was, that just destroyed me over and over and over again. It was one of his slants, you know, to the outside or whatever. Um, And that's when I first really started, like, trying to recreate plays uh, because I realized, man, that play is so deadly. You know, I want to I want to use that play. Now it's, it's, you know, you can take, you know, a slowed down version of it or, or whatever and, and try to make it yourself, but you still, you're never going to make it exactly how um, the previous person had it. Um, so that was when I first really started to like try to recreate plays. And then the next season after that is actually when I started playing George like twice a year, because I think I was in his division after that quite a few times. And I would just run plays against his playbooks all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, not off of his playbooks, but create new plays to try against his defenses, because I think that's like the best way to get good prep against good teams, make plays against those good teams, offenses, defenses, and um, find plays at work. And even if those the plays that you made to try to attack his defense don't work, still keep them, you know, for, for, you know, in your master playbook or whatever, because the plays that you're developing against those good coaches end up working, you know, against anybody um, or, you know, at least have like consistent success. The other thing I did, which maybe was a little crazy and Kyle could probably attest to this. Um, I, I think two seasons ago. <laughs> yeah. I think two seasons ago, I, I kind of changed my whole like prep um, system up. I took each play that I had. So say just play pass zero, zero, one. And I made that a full play in the same playbook. Then I made it a third down play in the same playbook. Then I made it a third down red zone 30 play. Then I made it a third down red zone 20 play and then 10 play. Then just red zone 10. So it would only run in the red zone on first and second down from the 10 yard line in. Then 20, then 30. And so each play was was eight plays. And I had 19 playbooks. Uh, so I ended up having to run uh, two laptops for a lot of, of the last couple of seasons. Um, this year is the first year I went back to kind of the old system. Um, but that kind of also like shows you like people have different quirks that you maybe you find like um, for example George you know anytime I, I prepped against George um, I would always find his red zone thirty defenses I'd crush I I um, you know have a twenty or thirty yard uh, pass that would that would connect pretty much any time it ran um, but then like you get in the game and it didn't always work that way obviously or or you have to be at that certain point to had that play run, but that's kind of where I was talking about earlier, where I think like play design got a little lazy because you had these plays that just would always work. And it was, you were choosing from, you know, plays that were averaging 20 yards at 80% against other plays that were, you know, 18 yards at 65% and you're trying to cut those and it's just so hard. Um, 
that you kind of just get lazy. You don't make new plays. You, you, you have plays that work and you think they're always going to work, um, but, but they don't. <laughs> Mike, I, I remember you would reach out and you'd be like, I'm having such a hard time cutting plays yep. because, and I'm like, oh, poor Mike, every play that you have is averaging 15 <laughs> plus yards. You know, what a tragedy. I remember that. Shit. But then, but then it's like a mental thing because then like, do you, you know, what if you cut the wrong play and the other play would have killed it? And I mean, you know, it's, it's dumb, but <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, but it made prep really long. And that's why I ended up having to change that system. That, that is a, a real downside to this game is the sheer volume of time, not only in creation of plays, but literally in prep. So what are some things that you guys have done to uh, reduce your prep time, like renaming plays or cutting out? Like, have you ever ran through and tried to delete just plays that just you haven't used in seasons or what are some things you guys have done? Go ahead, Mike, you go first. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm notorious, I think for like changing my, my systems every year of how, how I'm prepping. Uh, but for me, I really tried to cut down on the clutter because when you're looking at the transcripts, you're looking at um, scout pro and stuff like that. It's so easy to get lost and everything. So this year I actually really went through and did two things. Actually, I took every play I made it a scan pass and I made it a time pass. And then I just did, you know, pass 001 and then pass 002. Um, or actually, I'm sorry, when it, when it was a scan, I do pass 001, then I'd have whatever my code is after that. And then I'd have the same play pass 001, but then I would have a T at the end of it for timed. So maybe I'm giving away too much information. I don't know. Um, but I just tried to clean up everything because I think, you know, too many words, too many, you know, this or that, just it, it makes everything too complicated, too clustered. And for me, at least when I'm prepping, I'd much rather look at my P0015, you know, upper, upper uh, whatever you want to call it, carrot, whatever, um, three dash two, whatever, you know, that's, that's kind of my setup. Um, but I really went through this year and, and decluttered a lot of stuff. And then made multiple versions of each play, and and then did the scans and the timed. How about you, Kyle? Um, <clears throat> for me, again, I'm... when I uh, when I first joined, I asked five, six, seven different coaches what they did, and um, tried to come up with my own system, which I I think I do something different than everybody else, um, but. You know, offensively, I will assign um, who's getting the ball and where they're getting it on the field based on the code of the play that I they I named it. And uh, to not waste off-season time, I try not to change it. I don't think I've changed it since I joined. Uh, it's just it's very time-consuming to completely revamp and change your name. Um, what I do, I don't know if you guys noticed, but what I do when I submit playbooks now is I change the name right before I submit them to um, offensively a number one to how many offensive plays I have, and then um, a letters for defense. That way, when you guys get my playbook and you prep against it, you can't decipher any kind of code. Hmm. Um, I'm the only one that has the code. So um, basically, I'll just, I, I kind of do that, you know. This episode is brought to you by Webster's Kids. Do you need your offspring to ignore you all day long, except for the minute that you're watching your game? Hire Webster's Kids. Webster's Kids. Get in there, sit down, and stop talking. What do you do, Kepke? Um, I have screwed up royally um, a few <laughs> times. To the point where um, I this this last season I went and visited George and I got a, a good idea of how um, to be able to uh, fix some stuff. So I'm going to rename everything. See, in, in, when I prep, I feel like um, I want to make sure, first and foremost, that I'm not injuring my star players. Although this year I'm not so much worried about that. Um, <laughs> what what star I, players? <laughs> exactly. Um, my... I, I I would go through and check everything, but the problem is if I would um, load up uh, the transcript from Scout Pro, um, my my players' plays would be all, all over the map just from the way that I uh, labeled the play. So rather than starting with like pass number one, pass number two, I'm going to start starting with 
uh, wide receiver one, wide receiver two, running back, fullback this way. Like for me, that's easier to be like, okay, my running back has seven plays in this playbook. My wide receiver one has five plays in this playbook or my wide receiver two has 13 plays. That's ridiculous. I need to get a few out of there. Um, but I also last season started being just ruthless with the cutting. So rather than becoming attached to certain plays, like I know I fall in love with my pass number 57. Why? I have no idea. It doesn't do that well. It It is thrown out of bounds on like 14% of plays. It's It's ridiculously <laughs> stupid, but I love the play itself. And so, like, even when it's statistically doing poor, I still want to save it just to, okay, maybe the next cut, maybe I'll do some tweaking or something. And it just doesn't, it never seems to work out. So I've become just more ruthless in the way that I cut um, plays out of my playbook. Um, and again, especially this season, since uh, since I don't have to worry as much or I'm not, I'm not terribly interested in uh, making it deep into the playoffs. I want to make sure I have a better draft pick. I'm I'm just like, well, all right, that play works, you know, 50% of the time, but it gets 18 yards. Let's see what happens, you know, but that's. I, uh, I, I, I sort I on position of field before I do player, um, just a heads up, just because I want to make sure I'm spreading the ball mm-hmm. more so on, on player. Um, so that is, point that point is the end that. of my tag is like, I do what Shear does, because that he was one of the first people to help me out. He. He said he divides the field up into a grid, essentially sideline, left, left, middle, right, sideline, right. And then like a distance in the field goes one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So I try and uh, imitate him a little bit and I try and get um, at least like, you know, my running backs are 60, 40, whatever, you know, if there's something that's running to the left more often, that's fine. But I don't want, I don't want anything going all one way because god forbid <laughs> we, i it starts working but then uh defense just can can uh, figure that out so i do the same thing so i do so, sideline to sideline i do eight eight across and then i go wow 10 deep i think mm-hmm. so it's a little bit a little bit more detailed there, there might be some juice to that um, because who knows? I, I think uh, the, I made the championship game the past three seasons, but just couldn't get over the hump. So uh, there, there might be something that I need to do to be able to do it differently. And it, I mean, watching Mike, who's been to the bowl and, uh, and Sheer and obviously George and, and Derek, um, I haven't gotten I, I haven't gotten to know how Derek preps yet. I'm very curious about that. I hope hope he agrees to come on and talk to us. But uh, <laughs> I I would be super curious to know how Derek does it or how he preps, like his mentality with that. I I know Shear said that uh, he he developed his run game really well because he didn't use Scout Pro for the first couple of seasons. Yeah. I think Curtis said that too. Uh, he was telling me that uh, Derek developed his run game completely based on uh, visual, uh, which scares me because uh, the new coach that joined Scott, it was the same way. He didn't use Scout Pro either. And he ran all over Mike this week. So He did everything he – well, he didn't throw, <laughs> great, I guess, but he, I mean, he still – He ran all over you. He did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's I so mean, tough I, when you can't do anything about it, though. Ugh, like, it just – it hurts my heart a little. Yeah. You can't prep against it. But I gotta, yeah. I, I gotta be honest. I don't know about you guys, but um, this league is super competitive. I mean, when I first joined, or even before I joined, you can really segregate the top tier, middle, and then people you're just gonna destroy. And now it's like every team is like, shit. I hope I beat that guy. When when Ruffy is missing the playoffs, you know, uh, it's it's tough. When um, DC looks like a baller last week. <laughs> yeah quick turnaround i yeah. mean it's there's there's some great uh things in this league some great parody and actually kyle you stole my thunder a little bit that was gonna be my next question to to mike is mike your thoughts on the parody of the league and how it's changed so any other thoughts to add to that yeah you know it, it is definitely becoming um more equal more parody in the league um you know it's it's nice to see because you have um you know, maybe Ruffy's a, a great example of that where, you know, he used to not have to, 
maybe focus too much on the on the you know wins during the regular season because he knew he was going to make it to the playoffs and his good stuff was good. So he didn't really have to do a lot of prep during the week. And and maybe even same thing with George because you know the last couple of years George has lost games that you wouldn't normally think that he would lose. Um, but he would just kind of throw stuff together last minute and not really worry about it too much where you're starting to see now that, you know, he really has to start actually prepping versus everyone, or at least a lot of the players in the, in the league. And, you know, a lot of the newer coaches that came up after me, you know, Kupke, you're a, you're a great example of that. Um, you've come a long way. You know, I know this year maybe might be a down year for you, but you kind of traded everyone away, uh, but you're, a, you know, you've become a really good coach. You, you beat Salem a couple times in the playoffs, I think. And, and, you know, the parody's the parody's here, you know, um, Kodiak had a great year last year and, and it kind of really came on strong, which I don't think anyone really expected. Um, you know, Curtis is coming on and, and a lot of the coaches that maybe weren't as interested are gone. You know, Hexter, when he was with Maryland for what, one season, um, yeah. You know, uh, Bryce, who, you know, I love Bryce, and I think he can be a really good coach in this league, but, you know, just work was yes. too demanding. You know, those those players are gone. You know, John, who um, had a lot of talent but just never really tried. Um, the, everyone's moving on, and, and you know, new coaches are coming in that are hungry, like Kyle and, and Curtis, who I think by week seven, week eight last year figured out he could run the ball. Um, and, and might be able to be successful with that. Um, you know, you're starting to see the parody. Uh, what's what's your friend's name? Uh, Travis that came in. Travis, um, yeah. You know, I know he, he struggled week one, but um, he's got the hunger. You know, he's, he's trying. And, and I think that's the biggest thing is you have players that are willing to come in and, and put in the effort to get better um, and start to see the results. Like, look at Bart. Uh, that's another, you know, really good example where, um, at one point, he I think he admitted this. He was ready to quit because he just wasn't seeing the results and, and was struggling a little bit. I mm-hmm. don't remember if it was the year that he got the, you know, Wheeler Martinez or maybe it was a year prior to that. I'm not sure. Um, but that really reinvigorated him. And, and you start to see the wins and you start to taste it a little bit. And you, you realize, oh, shit, I can do this, you know. So the parody's here. I think the parody's definitely here. And, and the league's um, only going to gonna keep getting better, I think. And get- – when every week you you sign in and you're not quite sure if you're going to win, it it's there's definitely some more exhilaration. But it also sucks because, I mean, you spent how many hours prepping to lose yep. to that guy? <laughs> yep. And then you get a new coach that comes in that's played before and beats you. <laughs> yeah, how's Unreal. that feel? Scott, you big jerk. <laughs> Scott and I made a bet um, on that game. Nothing nothing crazy. Um, but we, we just said that whoever um, – lost the game would send the other player uh their favorite ipa in the mail so um i'm i i haven't said it yet um we talked about it the other day um <laughs> i forgot about it at first and then i think on like tuesday i sent them a message i'm like oh dude i forgot about, about a bet because we made that like draft night or something like that um i remember that bet yep what is so uh I, man i don't know i'm a big ipa guy you know i don't it's know if you've ever local. listened to my podcast supposed to be local yeah, I don't know if you ever listen to my podcast, but I do like a little uh, beer review on my podcast a lot of times before the episode starts or when it's starting. Um, big IPA guy, though, double IPA, uh, triple IPAs, if I can find them, but they're kind of kind of hard to find in New York. Um, what are you drinking right now? I'm drinking wine, actually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Katie wanted uh, Katie wanted some wine tonight. Ben was, ben was a little bit of a hellraiser tonight. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I have know, a question for you guys. Things. Yeah, I think it. Huh? Go for it. I, have, no. I have a question for you guys. So not to put everybody on the spot here and everything like that, but a, as seasons develop, you start to build rivalries with people that you play. Mm-hmm. Um, I have picks for both of you on who your guys' rivalries are, but I would be interested to to hear who you guys think your rivalry is and why. And anybody can start. Oh, I, I can. Good, yeah, I can. I mean, I can. I can make that real easy. Uh, I mean, Mycin has been my kryptonite for the last two seasons. Uh, I have not been able to beat him. I think in the last what what have, how long have we played? We played three, four, five, five times in the last two seasons, and I think he's beaten me four out of five times. And the only reason he didn't beat me the other time is because he had no reason to to prep for that game and show me anything for the playoffs. So. Um, <laughs> 
I also, just like Kyle, I'm jealous of the way that you were able to uh, build up your team. I'm also a little bit jealous of Bart uh, for the same reason, because we both came into the league at the same time. And I think I developed a little faster than Bart, um, uh, but Bart was able to uh, build a better team as a result for a few seasons. And so not that that's then players aren't the end all be all, but um, but I, I love the way that Bart has developed over the years. Um, so I don't get to play Bart that often. So my my actual nemesis right now has got to be has got to be uh, Mycin. But um, I in would your love, division. Yeah, nice. Uh, I, I would nice. love to play Bart um, more often, but that that might be down the road when the next time the divisions change. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I mean, mine, it's probably Roth. I mean, we've played, the problem with, with Roth and I is we've played so many times. You know, we, since season season six, we played twice. Season seven, we played three times. Season eight, we played three times. And last year, we played once, which was season nine. Um, so, I mean, like, you might be my easy answer, I guess. Um, you know, for the most part, I've come out on top recently, you know, in the last time, season six. But... I kind of have like a little quiet rivalry with uh, Sheer. And it's not really a rivalry, I'd say. Um, I just never beaten him. I think he's one of the only people in this league that I've never beaten. Um, I've it's beaten just, him. I don't know why. You know, it, it's, it's, I've had a couple close games with him. Um, but Eric, you might be able to attest to this. Sometimes they're just players that you just, like other people, like Kyle said, he just beat Sheer or he beat Sheer last year or whatever. Um, and good for you, Kyle. That's awesome. But like, <laughs> I haven't. I don't know, you know. It's just it's just how you match up, kind of like like the last couple of times you and I played Kepke. I think you're just as good of a coach as I am, you know. And and last year you you showed it, you know. But the year priors, I think I just had maybe a better team. I don't know, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I think you've developed a lot though since then. Uh, but I think like Ruff's probably my my main rivalry, and then in my head this year because I've never beat him. So, Mike, to that, and I think, you know, given a few more seasons, it'll be different because um, my ability as a coach and a playmaker has changed because there's just little things over each season that I'm like, oh, shit, we can do that? Like, it blew my mm -hmm. mind two seasons ago when I realized that you could you could uh, set running back um, uh, cues for your linebackers, but then also drop them into coverage. Mm -hmm. I had no idea they could do two things. <laughs> so, so, you know, as, and, and then the micro zones was a, was a big one for me. Once I realized like, Oh, you can just put a guy in this, the exact spot where that play is going to go. Um, so like as, as I start to learn these tricks and get a little bit better, I think the more we play, for example, you and I, it's different. Cause now, now you almost know who you're playing versus me who stunk, you know, three seasons ago and, and now it's different. So, yeah. 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 Let me ask you this, Eric. Um, you know, what was your transition like going from having a hundred speed wide wide receiver to not having a hundred speed wide receiver? Uh, well, it only I mean, it only lasted for a season because I had one season where uh Mark Clayton was my wide receiver one. Um, but then DC offered me uh Terry Ray out of the blue. That's and right, I yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Um That's true. And all he wanted was a second round pick. Now he was a uh, a year five guy. So there was a chance he could have retired at the end of the season. Um, but I had one season without a 100 speed and it's definitely not as much fun. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> having a guy that can go over the top um, is, is fun. But I think that season in between the 200 speeds, like you said, Mike, it, it made me better with um, making some plays like getting some uh clear out plays and getting some yeah. crosses and um and doing some things that i was out of my comfort zone doing yeah you really have to like manipulate the defense more without those players you have mm -hmm. to be able to design the plays to get that guy open um without the you know the 100 speed guys man they'll just get they'll get open <laughs> you know off the line um but you really when you don't have those players and and that's, like I said, what, what, kind of what I found out last year, starting a 75-speed wide receiver and then a 50-speed wide receiver, um, it, it's it's much tougher. You know, you have to work harder at getting them open. I also went from having, you know, a 100-speed halfback to a 70-speed. So just a lot of transition last year with that. Right. What's, uh, what's your plan with your team, Cupkey? You've got a lot of draft picks coming up. Um, I do. <laughs> 
my my offense currently isn't isn't terrible. I've got a, a year two um, a year two wide receiver, Greg Miller, who's who's doing pretty well. Um, and the uh, the tight end, I'm hoping to be able to cross whatever that magic number is um, to be able to get him uh, into the next uh, tier to go from 50 to 75 speed. Um, but the the plan is just to take the best available. I think I thought too much in previous years over trying to build um, a roster for you know where I needed. But right now, when you have all the holes to fill, I, I'm just gonna take the best available guy and and see what happens. Um, I don't think I'll kick the can down the road one more year. I think I wanted a year to be able to build up some defense. Sheer and I talked um, at length about um, just how much defense really can rule this game if you can get good at it. Um, and I just haven't been good at defense. I've been a decent offensive right. maker and yeah. uh, my defense has been scattershot at best and I haven't made a whole lot of new plays. So this, this is my season to go, okay, let's clear out all the, all the garbage and, um, and get a system in place. Like, again, not to, not to use anyone else, but like when, when I got to talk to George um, and George has his, set up for his regular plays and then his um, di- his nickel defense and then dime defense and how his AI is adjusted for for those plays um, and then the uh, the red zone plays and the the work that goes into it I, I don't have any of that like most of my plays are just hey there's a defensive play so that's gonna be my particular um, plan for the season is uh, seeing where defense takes me I got a I got a a taste of what I needed to do last season against George in the playoffs. I made four or five plays that specifically stopped um, some sideline plays of his and frustrated his offense in the first half of the game and and won me my playoff game. So I, I I really got inspired and I'm hoping to continue on personally. I think when it comes to defense, either uh, you're too amateur or new in league to know what to do Mm -hmm. or, or you are too overwhelmed with what you have to do and you don't do it. Because it's just, if you really want to create a good defense, that's a lot of work, man. It is a lot of work. I think overwhelmed is the is the right call. In order to be good at this game, like, like Mike went through the past couple seasons of the sheer volume of, um, of levels that you can do this at uh, base, nickel, dime, 340, yeah. 43, uh, red zone plays AI. It can and get how to yeah, how to correctly assign it too. Yeah, and to be yeah. organized too, like that's yeah. huge. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, Cupkey, if you have like plays that are all over your all over your scout pro, and and you're looking for here, then you're looking for there, then you're at the top, then you're at the bottom. If you're if you're not organized with those defensive plays, man, or offensive plays in general, it's just a mess. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, Mike, the first time I prepped against you, I have just three defenses that were called Syracuse one, two, and three. And when I, <laughs> when I look back at them, uh, the safeties were only 20 yards back, and they didn't have any coverage on them. They didn't have any zones because my very first computer that I had um, wouldn't allow me to create zones. Oh, man. Uh, like something was going on with the computer that it wouldn't let me. So, but the thing is, those plays have been in my defensive playbook for four seasons <laughs> so so that's the sort of shit i need to go through <laughs> yeah this year what, I did, what I did what i did what i did offensively for i and i should have done this defensively to start but what i did offensively is i listed every single offensive play and when i submitted it in which playbook mm-hmm. it i'm out and uh katie just came up and gave me the rest of hers so yeah. <laughs> lucky wife um so She's going to sleep so <laughs> so i listed every single offensive play and i would tally like okay season eight week four i submitted it and my goal was to this off season was to go through every play that i haven't submitted and change it because i would just consider a junk play and yep and change it so that way I have elite plays. Yeah, well, my laptop uh, shit the bed, and I lost all that data. So yeah. so uh, tip here is back up all your freaking files. 
Well, gentlemen, we're almost in an hour, and that brings us to the last question, which is what advice do you have for uh, our new guys or any future new players that come into the league? <laughs> Back up your foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, li- listen to veterans. They're um, here to help you. Uh, they want you to win because they want you to stay, and they want this game to be competitive. Uh, there's a lot, you know, I wouldn't say a lot of turnover, but there's some turnover in the league. And everybody's here um, to help, and they're super nice. Um, they're gonna they're gonna be honest with you. Uh, back up your files. That is legit um, helpful. And come up with a good system that works for you. And uh, I don't know. The first two seasons, mass production plays, and don't worry about winning games. You know, uh, if you win a game, great. You know, the first win is inspiring. I always like to wish uh, or congratulate the coach that wins their first game because it's 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 motivating. Um, but don't expect many wins uh, for the first couple of seasons. You know, you, you want to develop and get better uh, the first couple of seasons. That's it. Yeah. yeah, that mass production of plays is is key. I think uh, when the pandemic first started, I did nothing but create offensive play after offensive play because i didn't have anything to do for for a while i think i created 300 plays in a month and, <laughs> uh, and that's one thing that really helped me for sure uh-huh. mike how about you any advice for for our new friends yeah you know um you know just like kyle said mass production you know try to try to make as many plays as you can and don't d- delete them don't get rid of them um you know you can always tweak and you can always kind of change things a little bit if you need to or uh, tweak AI because I think AI is always a work in progress. Um, ask questions. You know, not only not only take advice, but ask questions. You have so many people in this league that are um, willing to help, um, but you know, we're not always going to be able to just say, "Hey, you know, Kyle, what do you need help with?" You need to be willing to you know reach out and, and ask questions. I think that's really key. Organization is is big. You know, definitely try to develop a system and, and stick with it, or at least make it make yourself um to the point of where you can at least change things easily enough with with naming or or saving plays or whatever as much as you can for for a good example of that is is um webster who for the longest time would literally just take plays from his old playbooks and put them into a new playbook and submit a playbook like he never had like a master playbook he would just literally do that every week and like i, I kind of look back at that and think like how could how good could have webster have been if he had, would ever have just gotten like a master playbook and kept all those plays in one folder. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I think my last bit of advice is get on the calls, you know, on Sunday morning, if, if you can, because um, those conversations are great. Um, the, the advice that you'll get in those games can really, um, really help, you know, and, and you can be like, why, see, why didn't that work? Or what, you know, what was wrong with that? I think one of the biggest things with, with Bryce for the longest time is he had plays that would like fumble every time they ran, or, but for some reason it kept making it into his prep. And then he'd have six fumbles in a game because he really wasn't on watching the games and he didn't, didn't see that. Um, so watch games, get on on Sunday. I think that's a big one too, that, that yeah. a lot of people do, I guess, but not everyone. Yeah. Seeing the actual game, knowing the difference between my running back gets uh, seven yards of carry on this play, but every six plays, that defensive tackle is able to break through the line and, and mm-hmm. cause that toss to be a fumble. It's not worth the, it's not worth the risk for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. The call, I agree. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out with me for the last hour. And, uh, and hopefully you guys get some sleep and your daughters don't interrupt you or your daughters and sons. <laughs> <laughs> no daughters here that I know of at least. Thanks. Carl. All right. I'll yeah, thanks you. man. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Take care. Thanks for listening. If you would like to be part of the podcast, I try and record at 8 p.m. on Thursdays. So if you're interested, please let me know. Ideas for the podcast include the history of the league, the way you build your team, uh, your best plays, the idea of how you build your plays, uh, the best victories you've had, the worst defeats, anything of that nature. If you would be interested in doing either a one-on-one interview or a group interview, please let me know.